You'll turn your Bibles to John 17. Just want to give a couple of notes and words before we pray and read scripture. Um, There, there's quite a move today in discussion about how pastors ought to handle how they read material and process material and how they make note of the material they read. Um, and I, I want to be fair. Um, there's no real new thoughts. Um, so I will say a lot of things this morning that uh, some of it, as I did word study, I thought these things, and I'm thankful that I wasn't alone. Other things I will say because good, faithful men brought me to a better understanding of those things. Um, and with some of the subject I'll deal with this morning, uh, there's a modern writer, Mark Jones. He has two books, The Prayer Life of Jesus and Knowing Christ. Both of these books have been helpful to me in weeks and months past. And then also Sinclair Ferguson's book on the Holy Spirit and John Owen's volume three on the Holy Spirit. All of those books have been very, very helpful. I'm not gonna just stop all the time and give every little quote of everything. I try to be faithful to do that when I'm quoting someone exactly. Um, But, but please note, I'm not making claim that I'm the greatest mind of anyone who's ever stood in a pulpit. Uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of plenty of men uh, who have come before me and been faithful. Um, so as you note those things, uh, you may go and read some of this material later and say, oh, well, John Owen said that. Fair enough, he did. Um, I may quote him exactly or I may, I may not. So I just want to make note of those things. I, I get wind every once in a while of what's on the internet and there's all these discussions about these things and I want to be fair and, and true. Um, I don't think I've ever made a claim that I'm the best mind that ever existed. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of lots of men, uh, faithful men who have come before me and so I'm thankful for them. Well, let's read. John 17, beginning in verse 1, and then we'll pray. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you asking for the mercy of the power of your spirit to deal with our souls. We are weak-minded. We've had much that has gone on in our week that's a distraction to us. And we come now to a time where we're supposed to sit and listen to the preaching of your word. So we ask your mercies upon the preacher. That he would be thoughtful in the words that he speaks to the people in its hearing. We ask that you would give the measure of your spirit that he would preach from the very truth of your word and the unction of the Spirit. Lord, we pray for the hearers. There will be many things that can flash through our minds during this time that we would not pay attention to the truth of your word and to glean from it and think through it. And we ask for your spirit to draw our minds in. 
Lord, where there needs to be change, conviction, where there needs to be thoughtfulness in our lives, will you please bring it to bear by the work of your spirit according to your word. We give all praise and honor and glory to you for the time of worship up to this point and ask that you would be glorified in what's about to happen. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to continue introducing the, uh, this prayer, the Lord's Prayer to you this morning. We've looked at the context of some of the prayers surrounding it, leading up to it. And this morning, in some ways, we'll continue to do the same as the Lord Jesus has cried out uh, to the Father. He spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, the hour has come. And the identification of Jesus speaking these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven. What we have is a connection and understanding of there's something greater taking place here than just the simple utterance of prayer in the simple context of words. We will look at the words of this prayer very carefully, but we want to continue to look at who's praying the prayer and the context of the prayer and the sense of what is happening even in the person of the Lord Jesus. This morning, we will spend the bulk of our time considering something very important in the prayer life of Christ. This prayer is a culmination of prayers, and in this prayer, in and of itself, we've come to a place that we need to recognize that this prayer in the life of Christ comes by the very work of the Holy Spirit. This prayer comes by the very work of the Holy Spirit. We don't often consider the work of the Spirit in the life of the Son. It's not something that we spend a lot of time focused on. But it needs to be noted for us for biblical reasons and also for something being worked out in our own lives. We're often asking for the Holy Spirit to work in us. What are we asking Him to do? We're also ones who need the very work of the Spirit in our own prayer lives. How will it come about? Well, some of those things, not all of them, can be seen, at least the starting point for them is understood in seeing the very Spirit's work in the life of Christ. When we think of Christ praying this prayer, we need to recognize this is the God-man standing in a point at history. Right then and there at that time, after he had already given and instituted the Lord's Supper, before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 18, verse 1, here's the Lord standing in front of his disciples praying a prayer in human body, right then and there, praying this prayer. The very content of this prayer, if you think about a human praying this prayer and the content of it, it ought to make you pause for a moment. A human standing and saying that the Father gave him authority over all flesh. A human saying that he is the Christ whom the Father has sent. A human saying in verse 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. And then in verse 5, a human man standing and saying, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This is not just any prayer. This is not just another prayer. It's not even the kind of prayer that sometimes we as pastors just pray from our own minds of repetition. This is the prayer 
of one who is very God, a very God, and very man, a very man. This prayer comes by the very work of the Holy Spirit. How can we say such things? Because if we're going to note who this person is praying this prayer, we would say, yes, well, he's the Son of God. He's deity. He's also human. He's made of flesh in some sense, whatever that means. I would say to you that we cannot neglect the very work of the Spirit in the life of Christ to recognize how this prayer comes about. This is a prayer, a Trinitarian prayer. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all working. Showing us the very essence, being co-equal in these things, praying in that moment. God the Father who is Spirit. God the Son, the one who is of the Father, proceeds from the Father, and who assumed human flesh so that he could become the very propitiation, the sacrifice for the sins of his people. And this is also the work of the Holy Spirit which is the very power of God the Father proceeding from both the, the Father and the Son to do a work that is amazing, far beyond what we could imagine. If we're going to talk about what it means for a dead sinner to be revived, to be regenerated by the very power of the Holy Spirit, we have to recognize that that Spirit was working in the very person of the Lord Jesus. How do we know this to be true? Number one, Jesus had to assume a human nature. If this prayer comes by the very work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus had to assume a human nature. The scripture tells us, Matthew records this fact that his human nature was wrought by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 18 through 20. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Later in verse 20, it says, For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This conception of the very person of the Lord Jesus is the very work of the Holy Spirit. If you get some real interest in spending some time thinking about this, I encourage you to read John Owen's volume three. He deals with this in depth from pages 159 to 188, but specifically dealing with the very conception of the God-man Christ in the womb of the virgin. He deals with this extensively in 160 through 167 to give an indication that this is something that is not often thought of in our context. That we have to see it rightly for what it is. He had to be conceived in her by the very Holy Spirit to bring about this sinless humanity that was necessary for the very propitiation that would be made. If the Holy Spirit did not do this work to bring about the conception of this child in her womb, she would have been conceiving and giving birth to a child like any other. When the Holy Spirit conceived this child in her womb, it did not make the Holy Spirit, as Owen says, the Father of the Lord Christ. Because the Holy Spirit is the very power of the Father working. This little child that was conceived by the very work of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin. This little child 
is the very Son of God who's now going to assume human flesh and be born into this world. He's still the Son of God, and yet at the same time, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin, he assumes flesh, and he is the Son of Man. When the Spirit works in this way, we need to note this was not a creating work of the Son. The Son did not create His human flesh. It was the Spirit that did it. This is why the whole of the work of God in every part of life and salvation is a Trinitarian work. If Jesus did not do a creating act and taking on this human flesh, what did he do? Owen says, but it was an ineffable act of love and wisdom, taking the nature so formed by the Holy Spirit, so prepared him or prepared for him to be his own in the instant of its formation. The Lord Jesus was doing an ineffable act of love and wisdom to take this nature on, and yet it was the Spirit, the Spirit who had formed this human nature in the conception in the womb. He goes on to say this was an instantaneous creating act. Now I want you to see something here. This is important. When we think of creation in the book of Genesis, we talk about the Spirit hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God is the very power of God acting and working. Third person of the Trinity, yes. Distinct in His person and yet very specific in His role, in His power, in His working act of creation. And in the creation of the very human nature of Christ, that creating power comes from the very Holy Spirit of God bringing about this nature, this human in the very womb of the virgin. It gives us an indication of what John was talking about when he says the word was made flesh in John 1, 1 14. The word was made flesh. And in Galatians 4, 4, the Son of God was made of a woman. We have to recognize that for this to have taken place, it was the very Spirit of God doing this work. The Spirit of God making this human nature. But also under this first context, we need to recognize his human nature was genuine in humanity, yet without sin. Here's why the Spirit of God was working and his working is necessary. It needed to be a humanity, yet without sin. Hebrews 2.14 and 17, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of the Son, Jesus, likewise also partook of the same. He had to be made like his brethren in all things. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, he calls him out, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. He took on that humanity. That Humanity of what kind? The Hebrews writer says, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. It is the Holy Spirit that wrought that child in the womb. This work that he did to bring about the very sinless humanity that was necessary 
for the Son of God to assume it in his ineffable act of love that he would live out the very perfection of God among men and do it with the weakness of the human nature and do it yet without sin. Sometimes it's easy for people just to assume that Jesus lived without sin just simply because, well, he's deity. But if you think about the context of what is happening, our understanding here needs to be that true enough, he is deity. That is true, very true, and needs to be held thoughtfully and carefully. And yet at the same time, in his humanity, the very Spirit of God was working in His humanity in that very same time that He would keep in line with the very truth of His deity in His humanity. Well, not only was His human nature, was it genuine humanity yet without sin? We need to see that his works and ministry in humanity are by the power of the Holy Spirit. If his human nature is by the power of the Holy Spirit, then his works and ministry in humanity are by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 22, at Jesus' baptism, it says, And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Not too long after this, almost within just moments after this, in Luke 4, 1 through 2, Luke records, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. When they had ended, he became hungry. This is the very Spirit of God in the very works of the person of Christ working in His human nature. This was necessary because Christ had to be like us in all things. He was given a true human soul. And the Spirit of God would work in His humanity. Even in the Spirit of God leading Him in the wilderness to deal with the temptations of Satan. Matthew 12, verses 28 through 31. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's been accused of casting out demons by Beelzebul, and he's going to shatter that whole identification. But he warns them. He says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's saying, you need to recognize that in my person, I am the very Messiah standing in front of you, very God of very God and very man of very man. And in that very man, the Spirit of God is working these works, these miracles before you. And I'm casting out these demons by the very power of God through His Spirit. This is an identification of the very Spirit first being revealed in such a way in the newness of the new covenant, not only is he going to reveal that in John 14, 15, and 16 to his own disciples, he's revealing it in the negative to these, these Pharisees by saying to, you them, to them that I cast out these demons by the Spirit of God. Well, then the kingdom of God is upon you. It's here. It's now. And here's the Spirit of God working along to confirm that in the very humanity of Christ. We must understand that before Christ came to the earth, He existed. 
There never was a time when he was not. But he did not and had not existed in the fullness of bodily form. But he was doing the will of the Father all the way along. Even though he had not yet assumed his human nature. So he and the Spirit's works were revealed differently in former times. Even the work of the Spirit was present in the Old Covenant. But it was revealed differently in former times. Then there's a time when the Lord Jesus comes to this earth and his works and the works of the Spirit began to be revealed in a different way. We see that Christ has his particular role and his particular works on this earth and the Spirit has his particular role and his particular works on this earth. Even the Spirit working in the continued human life of Christ. This should show you the necessity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If Christ and his humanity needed the Holy Spirit, then we need him much more. If the Spirit of God was working in the very humanity of Christ, we're in need of that same Spirit mega times more. We cannot walk away from our need of the very Holy Spirit of God dealing with our souls. We need to call upon Him that He would convict us and deal with us and deal with our very souls day in and day out. That we would not be left to ourselves. If his works are manifested in the humanity of Christ, why would we not need them? It brings us to at least ask a, a question. How else would Christ genuinely desire both in deity and humanity to suffer as the once for all sacrifice if the Holy Spirit was not working in his human soul to keep his human spirit in line with his deity. We get an identification of this in Luke 22 at the institution of the, the Lord's Supper. And Jesus said to them, verse 15, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Where does this earnest desire come from? From the very, not only the deity of Jesus, but from his very human spirit. And the spirit of God is working with his spirit. That he could say, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He had been saying his time had not yet come. His time had not yet come. In maturation in his own life, he did not know the day or the hour even of his second coming in his humanity. And yet, here it is. He comes to a place of maturation in his own life by the very work of the Spirit to be able to say, I'm earnestly desiring to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The time is coming. And he prays this essentially here in 17.1. Father, the hour has come. The maturation of the Spirit working in his humanity that he would be able to cry this out, not only as the Son of God in deity, but yet in his very humanity to cry these things out. Did Jesus need the Holy Spirit in the same way a sinner needs the Holy Spirit? No. But it shows us the congruency between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That even in the Son's humanity, the Spirit is working. I mean, the Scripture tells us plainly that the Son was maturing. Not only was He growing physically, but He was maturing. There was a maturation of wisdom in His life. 
This is pointed out a couple of times to us in the gospel to recognize that the Lord Jesus himself in his humanity is growing in wisdom. How is that wisdom coming about? Well, the very power of wisdom given to anyone is from the very Godhead itself and the very Spirit of God. The Spirit of the God is the one that grants wisdom and the one that works wisdom in anyone, in their person. The maturation that's taking place is not simply just something we can walk away and say, well, he just was deity. True enough. Yes, yes, and yes, and yes. But we see this intertwined work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even in the very humanity of Christ. It lets us know that the Holy Spirit worked in Jesus' human nature so that his prayers were in step with the will of the Father. Here we see a prayer where the very Son of God who is very God of very God and very man of very man is uttering things that are of utmost calculation to us. No other man could pray this prayer. No other man could say these things. And he says it in his very deity, yes. And yet while he's saying it, he's saying it with a human mouth that has a human mind and a soul. It's the Spirit of God working in, in his human soul. Owen takes some time in his volume, just a moment, to explain thinking about through or thinking through this Holy Spirit's work and even Jesus leaving that prayer and going to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he could literally pray in such a way. For the will of the Father to come about. Knowing what he was about to face, having a, an understanding of what he was about to go through, and, and yet to be able to say, Father, if it be your will, have this cup pass for me. If not, I want to do your will. We need to recognize that the prayer life of Christ is wrought with an understanding of his deity and his true, genuine humanity. And that the Spirit of God is working in him, even in his prayer life. It helps us to understand that this prayer stands in a long line of prayers for the Lord Jesus. He doesn't just come to this one prayer and never have prayed before, but the Spirit of God is working in his humanity in the sense that he's been praying all along while he has gone through every part of his ministry. Numerous times we give some, get some indication in the gospel, in the gospels, of what Jesus is doing. He's going to a mountain to pray. He's gone off somewhere to pray. He's gone off somewhere by himself. brings us to a place to ask some questions about our own prayer lives. A, would we say that we even have one, that we have a consistent mentality, as the Lord Jesus did in his life, to pray? The Lord Jesus was often leaving the disciples to pray. Are we recognizing that we especially as those regenerated, dead from our sins to life in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are in need of the Holy Spirit in our prayer lives. I'm not talking about some awkward thing where the Holy Spirit shows up and makes me do things that I would never do before or my head starts spinning in weird ways. I'm not speaking of that. I'm speaking of us taking the very Word of God and praying the Word of God in such a way that the Spirit of God is dealing with our own souls. And we're calling out and asking. The 
that these would not just be mere prayers or words of thoughtlessness, but they would be words of prayer from God's word wrought by the Holy Spirit, sealed in our very souls. Holy Spirit working in the human soul of Christ is knitting him to the very word of God and will of God that even in his prayers he's praying these things in a way that God the Father is glorified God the Son is doing his work and God the Spirit is working to glorify both Son and Father how much more are we in need of the Spirit of God How little do we think of the Holy Spirit? Think about the very fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians. It's fruit of the Spirit worked out in the regenerate soul being sanctified. The Lord Jesus in his humanity exhibited the fruit of the Spirit in all of its fullness and essence. So that when he went to the cross, he exhibited that by the very power of the Holy Spirit so that when he went to the cross, his death would matter. His death would would accomplish something, as the Hebrews writer says. So much so that he would commit his spirit into the hands of the Father. Ask yourself this morning. The same spirit that did his works in the life of Christ Is that the spirit I'm seeking to work in me? Because I can tell you right now, when you look at the life of Christ, Christ literally hated sin. It wasn't just in his human spirit that he was sinless and wrought by the very spirit of God but it gave him a true, holy, righteous hatred of sin. We will not be perfect on this earth, but we are in need of the very Spirit of God to deal with our souls in that way. We come to the Lord's table this morning. May we not take lightly the opportunity to seek the very Spirit of God to deal with our souls in conviction that we would rightly repent and confess our sins before God. Not just a confession of just I'm sorry in the moment, but a confession that's spirit raw, that we would also be asking to move forward in a way that we would hate our sin, that we would want to fight against it. As we think about this prayer going forward, please don't take it as just rote words in the moment like we, including myself, might pray at any given moment. Words or phrases that we've often used. This is the very Son of God praying to the Father a spirit-wrought prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the triune God is revealing his very work to the very disciples that are hearing it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, 
for who you are and what you've done. Praise you for sending your son, for his life and death, and his resurrection. We praise you that it's the Spirit who worked in his life, in his humanity, not only in bringing his humanity about, but also throughout his life and then in his resurrection. Lord, it gives us real hope that you can genuinely save us and keep us. If you would employ the spirit in the life of your very son, it tells us to give you praise that when you employ the spirit in our lives, it is to save us and keep us eternally. Give us hearts and minds to kneel before you this morning, that we would glory in you alone. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let these words not be rote words, but words that we would think on rightly. That we would ask that you not leave us to ourselves, our own human sinful natures, our own remaining flesh. Don't leave us to that. By the power of your spirit, bring your word to bear in our souls today, especially as we come to the time of the table. Please don't let us take the table thoughtlessly as it's just another thing that we do. Will you give us, by the power of your spirit, wisdom to come to the table rightly and worship your son? remembering him and by the power of your spirit confessing our sins give us a godly sorrow of repentance genuine that we would hate our sin and that that hate of our sin would produce a spirit wrought joy a joy like no other. It's not just mere endorphins of our bodies, but it's a joy of the greatness of the work of the Spirit in our souls. We are in need of you. Holy Spirit, deal with us today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hymn number 176.